It's a separate thing. You want to come back to our It looks like the project money is here on time, which is quite remarkable. Now, we just had uh, an excellent uh, IPC colloquium by Bob Fisher, who is uh, on sabbatical here from UMass uh, in Dartmouth. Um, and one, he talked about the Type 1A supernovae, uh, and it sounds like it's still a mystery why uh, there are such good uh, distance indicators. We, we don't fully understand. Uh, but nature was very kind to us, uh, and we just accept its gift uh, for now. Um, so we we'll hear first from uh, Michael Johnson, who uh, just became a uh, uh, staff Smithsonian uh, employee. Used to be a postdoc uh, here at the CFA, um, and he will talk about the uh, stochastic optics, uh, scattering mitigation framework for PLDI imaging. Uh, and then we'll hear from uh, Bob, Fish Bob Fisher. Uh, we'll talk about late time uh, light curves of type 1A supernovae. Uh, and after that, uh, from Orr Brow, who is a new postdoc here at the CFA, uh, we'll talk about the uh, Loss revisited supernova rates uh, from the Lick Observatory supernova search. Uh, and then from uh, Peter Williams, uh, we'll talk about the variable and polarized radio emission from T6 round walk. Go ahead, Mike. Great. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, today I'd like to, to share sort of an interesting story that we've been working on. And, and the basic problem that we're thinking about is. You know, how do objects look at extremely high angular resolution because of scattering in the interstellar medium? And, you know, what can we do to mitigate the effects of scattering for the highest resolution observations that we can make? Uh, so before I start, let me just say this is work that's done in collaboration with many people, notably Ramesh Narayan here, my former advisor, Carl Gwynn, uh, a number of postdocs and grad students here, uh, Catherine Rosenfeld, Lindy Blackburn, Kazu Akiyama, um, Andrew Shale, and with Vincent Fish at Haystack. Um, so, the, the interstellar medium contains these regions of, of ionized and turbulent uh, plasma. And because the index of refraction in a plasma depends on density, these regions scatter radio waves. Uh, and the, the important thing that I want to emphasize right off the bat is, you know, the scattering is stochastic. It's from, from these irregular regions. And it produces a number of common effects. Uh, one is that if you look at a, an object through the scattering material, the, the image appears broadened on the sky. It gets sort of blurred out. Another is that if you have something that's sending pulses of emission from behind there, those pulses get broadened. And this happens for things like pulsars. And the third is that there's scintillation. So if you look at a source behind the scattering material, it twinkles. And uh, you, you're probably all familiar with the idea that if you go out and look at the night sky, you see that stars are twinkling. And this is because of propagation in the atmosphere. Um, what you might not be familiar with is that the first person who correctly identified this as a, a propagation effect was Isaac Newton. Um, so anyway, so the main question that we're, we're interested in asking is what is the appearance of a scattered AGN or other very compact source? And what can we do to mitigate the effects of scattering on that image? So probably the most famous scattered source is our own galactic center supermassive black hole, Sag A star. And ever since its discovery, people have been looking at it and making images with BLBI at a number of different wavelengths, pushing them to shorter and shorter wavelengths. And what they've seen is that as you go to a higher frequency or shorter wavelengths, the image gets much, much smaller. And it follows this very nice lambda squared scaling. And this turns out to be a very generic scaling for scattering. And so what you're seeing is not an intrinsic structure. You're seeing just the scatter broadened image. Uh, and the intrinsic structure could be a point source, or it could have interesting structure, and so forth. What you'll notice in this, though, is that you, as you push to shorter and shorter wavelengths, all of a sudden the size that you're measuring breaks from that lambda squared. And that's because the intrinsic structure of the source is poking out. And so you can see this is, real, this is the motivation for things like the Event Horizon Telescope, which are you know, projects that are uh, aiming to image Sag A star in regions that aren't completely dominated by the scattering. So this, this type of effect's been known for a long time, this blurring. But it turns out that there's a second effect from scattering that wasn't really appreciated. And this is that the scattering also introduces substructure, so the opposite of this blurring effect. And the substructure is actually stochastic. It'll, it'll change over time. It leads to things like refractive fluctuations of AGN, uh, where you see fluctuations of, of their total flux density. And for a long time, it wasn't clear whether that was intrinsic to the source or extrinsic from the scattering. And now we know in most cases it is the scattering. 
Uh, and the other peculiar thing about this substructure is it's more and more important as you go to higher frequencies. And most importantly, it turns out to be a critical uh, consideration for VLBI. So I'll explain why. Uh, so just digging into this refractive substructure a little more, this movie is one where I've just made a simulated scattering screen and I'm sliding it across the source. And that, that intrinsic source is just a bright ring on the sky. All the variability you're seeing here is from the scattering material. And so you can see all the small scale substructure there. And what that does is that if you have a very long baseline in your interferometer, it's, it's predominantly seeing lots of power that's introduced by the substructure. And that's why as you go to higher angular resolutions, this becomes more and more important. The other thing that this does is you'll notice that the ring has anisotropies introduced from the scattering. So for projects like the EHT, we're interested in looking at the, the shadow of Sag A star. And if we see anisotropies, we want to be able to associate those with departures from canonical GR in strong field limit. The problem is the scattering can do the same thing. And so what we need is we need a framework where we can robustly disentangle effects such as anisotropy from the scattering and anisotropy that's intrinsic to the source. And just to give you a sense of things, one second in this movie would be about one day for the EHT in terms of the, the effects of scattering. So uh, focusing on Sag star a bit more, uh, here's an example of the scattered image at 400 gigahertz. Uh, and you can see at 400 gigahertz, the, the scattered image, it just adds a little bit of extra fuzz. It, it doesn't do much. And I'm just going to step down in frequency now, and you can see that same image, how it would appear at different frequencies of the scattering. And here we'll stop at 85 gigahertz. And the reason for this is this is the highest frequency v VLBI that you can do with a global array that's not the EHT. So again, this is just pointing out the, the absolute critical importance of the EHT for getting down and, and really resolving intrinsic structures on sort of scales of like a short shield radius. Uh, Oh, so this is just basically brightness on the sky with some color bar that I'm, I'm not showing, but it is a linear scale. So th this is basically if you had a perfect telescope and you're looking up at the sky, staring at Sag A star, that's what you would see. Um, right. So our goal is to develop a mitigation strategy where we can sort of uh, get around some of these problems. And what we'd like to do is develop something that's analogous to adaptive optics. So adaptive optics was conceived by uh, Horace Babcock back in the early 50s. And what he realized is if you had some sort of feedback mechanism, you could be solving for your, your uh, perturbations in the wavefront and also correcting a deformable mirror that's inverting those scattering effects. And so this was first implemented in the late 80s and it's now really a fundamental part of large ground-based telescopes. And it's had a lot of uh, great triumphs. Probably the most famous is uh, staring at the galactic center and looking at S stars, looking at these orbits of S stars. Um, so what we've developed is a, an analogous framework called stochastic optics. And the real idea for this framework came from uh, a paper by Roger Blanford and Ramesh Narayan where they were looking at the scattering of pulsars. And what they realized is you can take the fluctuations in the scattering screen and decouple them into these two components, diffractive and refractive. Diffractive fluctuations occur on extremely small scales, much smaller than we could resolve with an interferometer. And so those can be replaced by just their ensemble average effects. And that's the blurring that we've already seen. But what we'll do is we'll keep the refractive effects on top of that. And it turns out that then you can take the unscattered image plus the refractive perturbations and all other aspects of the problem to estimate the scattered image are deterministic. So here's kind of the, the basic picture for how it'll work. In normal VLBI, you have a bunch of visibility measurements and you reconstruct an image. We're going to reconstruct two images at the same time. We're going to reconstruct the unscattered image in parallel with reconstructing that large scale stochastic phase screen. And if we take the two of those and we slide the phase screen over that, that blurred out unscattered image, what you get back is the, the image that has all that large, all the small scale structure that you actually see on the sky. Now, as I said, this has a lot of parallels with adaptive optics. Uh, but I just want to point out, you know, it's not a completely hopeless problem to solve for these two things at the same time. In adaptive optics, they have to be solving for a scattering solution on timescales of sort of milliseconds. Whereas for us, because the timescales in the ISM are much shorter, it's, uh, we, we need to solve for a new screen on timescales of about a day. Uh, another thing is that in, uh, for optical scattering in the atmosphere, it's basically achromatic. So even if you have multi-frequency information, it doesn't buy you much. Whereas we've seen the scattering in the interstellar medium has the steep lambda squared scaling. And so multi-frequency observations are really powerful. 
Another aspect is that for adaptive optics, you don't have phase information, and you have to be performing the mitigation in real time. For stochastic optics, we're using instruments that record the whole coherent wavefront, and you can do this mitigation in post-processing. And the last thing is that you know, adapt adaptive optics relies heavily on lasers and guide stars. And this actually turns out to be a key difference between the two regimes of scattering. There, there's sort of no parallel that you can construct for the radio case. So even the galactic center magnetar, which is only three arc seconds away from Sag star, is thousands of times away, too far away to be used as part of a mitigation strategy. But what we do know for the radio case is the time average power spectrum of the scattering, and it has a very simple form. And so we can use this to regularize the solution, and it's a very important part of it. So I just want to show you a couple examples of this in work. Um, here, what I'm showing you are simulated observations. So we take just simple images, we simulate the effects of scattering, and then we take the array that we expect to have in 2017, and we sample it and reconstruct images using a variety of techniques. So in this case, it's just that ring from before, and after scattering, you know, it doesn't look much like a ring anymore. Um, using a conventional imaging approach, what you get back is a pretty good approximation for the scattered image. Of course, you know, that's not telling you much about the ring that, that you'd like to study. There's an extension to this where what you do is you can deconvolve that blurring effect of scattering from the image. And the problem here is that this approach doesn't account for the substructure. So it actually amplifies the substructure in the image, and you end up with a, a bunch of spurious compact features. So again, not a very good uh, approximation of that unscattered image. And then the last image on the right there is just with stochastic optics, and you can see now, now we can uh, clearly reconstruct this ring for observations in uh, 2017 at three millimeters. Now, and the other thing is with stochastic optics, you also get the phase screen along with this. And the neat thing there is that if you know the phase screen at one frequency, you know it at all frequencies. So this is another deterministic property of the scattering. So by creating the solution at three millimeters, you could use it as part of mitigation for, for something like the EHT2. Uh, so how about for the EHT? This is a simulated observation, again, with the arrays we expect in 2017. And again, the conventional approach does pretty well, giving back the scattered image, which here is not so bad. But uh, deconvolution, again, pushes that to a little better regime. You can start to see that, that bright ring feature, but you get a lot of spurious compact features in the image. And again, stochastic optics sort of does better than both and gives a pretty good approximation of the unscattered image. And these reconstructions will continue to improve as you increase the bandwidth of your array and as we eventually push to 345 gigahertz as well. So just to summarize, you know, scattering is really a complex observational challenge for VLBI. Diffractive scattering introduces this blurring that gets much weaker at higher frequencies, and this is the push to high frequency VLBI. But paradoxically, there's this other effect of scattering that does the, exactly the opposite effect. It introduces substructure and gets stronger at higher frequencies. And this is a fundamental limitation on VLBI. You can't get around it by building a bigger array or pushing to higher sensitivities. All that does is give you a better approximation of the scattered image. And the other thing is that this is an increasingly important effect as you go to the, high, the highest angular resolution, so with space VLBI and uh, projects like the EHT. And with stochastic optics, we're directly solving for the unscattered image and these re uh, refractive perturbations. And you're sort of integrating the limitations of scattering, but also using the many deterministic properties to get a pretty good representation of the unscattered image. So this should be immediately applicable to observations of SAG-J star from 1.3 millimeters up to you know, 3.5 centimeters. Uh, so hopefully we'll have you know, exciting new results on that soon. Thanks. Do you want me to talk slower? <laughs> yeah. uh, so this is not responding to. Oh, here we go. Uh, maybe someone else who's. Yeah, so, so this is actually one of the most exciting features of this particular mitigation strategy, is that once you solve for the scattering screen, it's good for a whole night. 
And, and so if there's rapid source variability, I mean, the variability of Saturday star is probably occurring on timescales of tens of minutes or maybe an hour. So that sort of variability would occur with static scattering screen. It would actually help your solution of that, that uh, static scattering screen because of intrinsic variability of the image. Another interesting thing is scattering can, can actually enhance the signatures of variability. So previously, it was thought that, that scattering would just blur out all the small scale stuff that's happening maybe at three centimeters. But actually, this uh, substructure preserves that signature. And so we might be able to see it once we add Alma in, in the spring. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So one nice thing about this strategy is this, this is sort of a natural, it's like a plug-in for other imaging algorithms. And so what, as we continue to develop new algorithms to, to mitigate variability or study variability, this can be just a, it's sort of a natural extension of them. Yeah, so I, I don't think that's true. So for instance, something like speckle interferometry, you know, this, this uses this idea that you have a source that's maybe changing or you know, a binary that, that's identically scattered. And you can, you can take a Fourier transform in the image and recover the intrinsic structure. I think that there would be something analogous in this case that if it, in this situation you say, where you have an intrinsic source that's changing rapidly in time, I still think that can be robustly decoupled from the scattering. Yeah, yeah it's worth thinking about. Mm. Yeah, so, these lobes. Yeah, so, so this here, this is the VLBI beam. That's, that's the resolution of the instrument. Uh, so, so you'll notice it's sort of elongated. And the bright lobes are appearing where they're, uh, they're tangent along the major axis of that beam. So that's actually an effect. Same with these bright lobes are because that's where it's aligned with the tangent to the major axis of the scattering. It's sort of an artifact of... Um, of applying an asymmetric for storing beam. The original ring is isotropic, is it? It is isotropic. Yeah. Yeah. So there you have an original object that is completely uniform, and it's produced this very asymmetric uh, design. Yeah, I guess uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is this asymmetry is a consequence of the scattering. This asymmetry is a consequence of um, instrumental resolution. It, it, could be, it could be understood based on your knowledge of, of your instrumental beam. Um, yeah. Uh, is it information or? That's a great question. So for SAG A star, I would say SAG A star is a bad example, right? Because it's intrinsically variable. So it's hard to, if you look at something changing in time, it would be hard to, to confidently assert that it's you know, some turbulent screen or something like that. I think this is something that you know, we need new observations, continued observations to really pin that down. But the, the diffractive blurring effect, that is a manifestation of a fundamentally stochastic process. There has to be a lot of small scale irregular power in the image to produce that. So, so you wouldn't see that lambda squared scaling of the source of, of the size of Sagittarius star if it, if it was just some, some regular ionized region. It has to be turbulent. Yeah. Yeah, so, so any sort of image reconstruction with VLBI is, is under constrained. It always has to be done in some regularization scheme. So this is usually done by, by basically enforcing that your image is smooth in some way or, or, or using a, a maximum entropy constraint on the image. There's, there's basically an analogous maximum entropy constraint on the scattering screen because I'm assuming that we know the time average power spectrum of the scattering. And so, uh, so it, it falls into just this very general framework of regularized minimization. Yeah. Um, it's very simple. I, I can show you more details you know, offline. Or what. what was that? It is, since yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much.
going to set that down first. Okay, so it's my pleasure to uh, talk about uh, something which I love to talk about, which is type 1A supernovae, and to talk about the late time light curve behavior, which I think is a really important, crucial test that we have for type 1As and to determine their stellar progenitors. And in particular, I'll talk a little bit about the importance of diversity for those tests. So to begin with, uh, I'll ask a question. It's a basic question that people like to ask when they think about supernovae. Think about the way people thought about this a few years ago when people thought that all type 1A supernovae were Chandrasekhar or mass white dwarfs. So Stan Woosley framed the question this way. He said, basically, if we have just one variable, this is kind of a rhetorical question, which is a Chandrasekhar or mass white dwarf, how do we account for the diversity of type 1A supernovae? So you might say, well, ha, that was 2001. This is 2016. I know the answer. It's, there's two channels. Well, that's part of the answer, for sure, because the single degenerate channel where you have a main sequence, a red giant star accreting mass onto the primary, building up to the Chandrasekhar mass exploding, is one possible channel. There can also be merging white dwarves, the double degenerate channel, which would ultimately explode. There may be other channels that people talk about, too. Uh, double detonations, mergers, uh, uh, rather uh, head-on collisions, and so on. That's not the entire explanation, however, because now we know that there are some events that have been discovered very recently where we've seen the shock companion uh, in 12CG, IPTF 14ATG. IPTF uh, 14ATG is slightly subluminous. Uh, 12CG is a normal 1A. Uh, there's also a supernova remnant that we talked about at lunch, 3C397, which, if you model it, seems to suggest it's a normal to slightly overluminous event. So there is a diversity even among, let's say, the single agenda events and quite likely in the double agenda events as well. What can we learn about these? How can we really discriminate between these two categories? So what I'm going to talk about is an important uh, observational property of the light curves which is what happens at late time in the light curve of a type 1A supernovae. And many of you probably have heard that the primary part of the light curve is powered by the radioactive decay of nickel-56. Nickel-56 is a proton-rich element relative to the value of stability. It beta-plus decays mm -hmm. down to cobalt-56 and then to iron-56. And that's what's shown up here, this uh, curve, which is this dashed line. What we're seeing here is the late time light curve, log luminosity versus time, that part is for this uh, light curve, the decay of cobalt-56 in the late part. But there's also other decays associated with other radioactive isotopes which are produced in the type 1A. Another one is the analogous uh, 57 chain. If I have cobalt, uh, sorry, nickel-57 initially produced, that will beta-plus decay down to cobalt-57 in a short time, around 36 hours. The cobalt uh, 57 uh, internal captures down to iron 57, which is then stable on a longer time scale than iron 56 decay finally. So this is around 270 days. And that's what's shown here. There's two curves in this model that Fritz published a few years ago. These are the predictions for single degenerate and double degenerate. So the predictions in that model for the nickel 57 chain are nearly the same between the two. But there's another chain still, which is cobalt 55. Cobalt-55 decays down to iron-55 in a time scale of just 18 hours. And iron-55, unlike iron-56 or iron-57, is unstable. In itself, electron captures on a time scale of three years. And that's what's shown in these lower two curves. And in that model, you can see the single degenerate is the upper curve, the double degenerate is the lower curve. And there's a marked uh, difference in the nucleosynthetic yields of iron-55 in those two models. That is reflective of the burning conditions inside of a Chandrasekhar mass white dwarf. You produce more of the iron 55 
in that uh, Schneider-Zinker mass y dwarf. So that leads to a prediction that the single degenerate light curve should be slightly higher, about half a mag or so at late times, and we're talking about a time scale here of around uh, 1,800 days or longer, that you could see a market difference between those two. That's an important prediction that is a testable prediction that people are actually working on, including Orr, who's here, and Ben Shafi and others are working on right now. So the question I want to, uh, po well, let me point out one more thing. The models so far have staked out two firm predictions. There's a single degenerate prediction and a double degenerate prediction. Iron 55 to cobalt 57.68, the double degenerate is, gives you a ratio of 0.27. The question I want to ask is, how does the impact of supernova diversity impact that prediction? There's an sort of inherent variability in both channels, and I want to focus on the single degenerate channel because that is one which is um, more well understood than the double degenerate channel in terms of what that makes, uh, what the prediction the single degenerate channel makes for those abundances, which is a crucial prediction for this test. So we recently computed a bunch of single degenerate models this shows the electron fraction. Electron fraction, YCB, you can think of very simply, it's the number of electrons per baryon. So like in carbon-12 or oxygen-16, you have one electron per two baryons. That ratio is a half. And so starting with a pure carbon-oxygen white dwarf, you have an electron fraction of a half. And that's what's shown in the middle panel. Left panel shows you temperature in this model. The right panel shows you burning, you can think of, zero to one from fuel to ash. And this, we did a series of models, a large set of these, this shows a deflagration to detonation transition, but we also did pure deflagrations. We did gravitationally confined detonations. We varied the progenitor white dwarf. We varied how the white dwarfs were ignited. And a kind of typical outcome here, as you can see, you produce uh, neutron-rich elements, including iron-55, in the core during two phases. You can see the bubble which burns through here buoyantly rises. It undergoes a detonation as it transitions close to this isocontour and you can see the detonation propagating back through the star in this plot. And in the middle, you can see the red region here is the neutronized material of the core. That's basically what's happening, broadly speaking, in this class of single degenerate models. And the question you can ask is, how does that impact the ratio of iron 55 to cobalt 57? The answer is, you get a wide range. You get everything basically from 0 to 1 here. But what's interesting is, and what we're showing here on the vertical axis, is that ratio taken from the explosion model. So when you look at the explosion model, we're computing these on the time scale of a few seconds. So you have everything that would radioactively decay to iron 55. So nickel 55 and cobalt 55 and iron 55 ratioed to the stuff that will become cobalt 57, which is nickel 57 and cobalt 57. That's on the vertical axis. What's shown here on the horizontal uh, axis is the amount of cobalt 56, which is in the explosion model, nickel 56 and cobalt 56. And this is a wide range of models. So at first, this doesn't look very promising, right? But it correlates with the amount of nickel 56, and it breaks up into two major classes right away. One is the class of pure deflagrations. Those are the subluminous events with about 0.1 solar masses of nickel 56 or less. And the other is the class of all the detonations. This is taking a wide range of detonations, regardless of the explosion mechanism, regardless of what the metallicity is, they follow a linear trend, and that's you can fit a line right through them. Why this trend? Well, to produce this amount of nickel 56, you need a dense white dwarf. So there can't be very much pre-expansion in the white dwarf. Therefore, you need very little deflagration. Therefore, you produce very little iron 55 to cobalt 57. As you enhance the ratio, as you enhance the deflagration energy release, you enhance the ratio of iron 55 to cobalt 57. The point about this is that knowing the amount of cobalt-56, you can calibrate the prediction to a given event. And the scatter also is important here. Often models and modelers don't talk very much about model uncertainty, but this also gives you a measure of the uncertainties in the models themselves. So there's, and there's two very clear predictions. There's two linear fits to those two families. And we can also look on that same uh, set of families 2011 FE, if you look at uh, Ben Shafi's uh, yield for cobalt 56, or nickel 56 in the original explosion, it's around 0.3. So actually, that's not very far off. But other events, like uh, which are being followed up now, uh, like Assassin 14 LP, will have uh, the single giant model predicts a markedly lower abundance. 
And that's uh, an important prediction. And uh, so just to show by contrast, the single prediction of 0.67 that we showed earlier is that straight line there. So somewhat counterintuitively, even a brighter event may not necessarily produce a, a brighter late time light curve because it will have less uh, iron 55 because it's had more deflagration energy release. So I just want to wrap up with a couple of points that I think are important current and future directions. Like on the modeling side, I think modelers need to really focus on this particular issue in particular because uh, we need model ratios of iron 55 to cobalt 57 accounting for the intrinsic variability for, I've talked only here about single degenerates, but we need them also for the other models, the double degenerates and the double detonations and other major classes calibrated to cobalt 56 and other key intrinsic observables so that we can stake out a firm prediction that the observers can test. And on the other side, we need to extend ongoing surveys and we need a sample of around a dozen, 10 or 12 uh, late time light curves that we can compare against those calibrated predictions. And with that, we'll be able to, I think, pin down the origin of the progenitors in those systems, whether they're single degenerate and double degenerate. And understanding those spectral classes and spectral identifications, I think, will help us understand uh, the nature of the standardizable candle even better. Thank you. Yes. I'm curious if you think there's any physics about DDT that could be missed in the simulations, say small scale things like caustics that develop in the shocks as they emerge upon uh, locus in the point within this agreement. So the welling is a paper where you did uh, some shocks propagating, uh, starting off with no perturbations, but they end up developing little over densities and under densities in them. And you only can see these in very, very high resolution. I'm wondering if there are things like that that could imagine could maybe bridge the gap where the detonations behave a little bit differently. So that's an interesting question. Uh, I think, I think uh, the, the general trend, I think, is as you do uh, higher resolution simulations, as you capture more of the deflagration energy release, that may be possible. I'm not sure that it's easily achievable, uh, such a low amount of uh, nickel 56. Uh, in, in any simulation that, uh, for a normal 1A without having to sort of introduce the structure artificially. And that's often what's done is people introduce the burning fronts uh, artificially with many ignition points. But the other thing I would add to that is that uh, you can also uh, use a higher central density white dwarf, and that's kind of what we were talking about in the noontime seminar. The higher central density white dwarfs, by necessity, have a higher laminar burning speed initially and have a higher deflagration energy release. So one thing that you'll see is that it's naturally easier to get more deflagration energy in a different uh, higher central density progenitor. In the double degenerate scenario, we don't even know how to do the ignition, right? And that's not clear what's causing it. Yes, it, exactly, Avi. So I think that's a very good question. Uh, I'd say there's probably two sides to that. I'd say if you wanted to do something very rough, but probably may not be very far from the uh, truth. Uh, because the, uh, if, it's a, if it's a relatively violent merger or one which is relatively prompt, then the primary doesn't have a chance to respond to the detonation. So for instance, the kind of calculations Stuart Sim did where he just detonates a, a, a sub-Chandra Zekar white dwarf. And you could vary that. Uh, mass of the white dwarf, that's a rough estimate. But I do think that we need to actually do this more properly to come up with a firmer prediction. Um, so most of supernova cosmology is based on the 1A light curves earlier near peak. And so do these um, different progenitor channels, or expulsion channels, um, could you produce the, the same filter relation between the luminosity and light curve shape near peak, or do they not? That's a very good question. I think basically for what people have found is that most single generates don't reproduce the, the, uh, the Phillips relation, the sort of line with size relation. Uh, my interpretation of that might be that either we're missing something about the physics or they, there may be something which is abnormal about them. Uh, the double degenerate channel, I think, it, it sort of uh, connecting to what Avi was saying, 
the sub Chandrasekhar models in general can produce uh, very good spectra, very good uh, Y and size relations, uh, but with a problem that we don't understand how to detonate them. They're sub Chandrasekhar, so it's a very hard problem. Dynamically, they're rock solid stable. They're very hard from a theoretical perspective to understand how we ignite them. Well, we, we, we have an expert on this, I'm sure. There have been only a few. A been only a handful. I don't know if Aur wants to comment no, on that. I wouldn't even say a handful. We followed two. So one. <laughs> um, and I have the HSC time to follow two more. So we're going to double the sample. Um, <laughs> the relations will begin this November. So, as, I mean, as long as Robert is on every HSC tag, <laughs> um, I we'll get to 10 at some point. <laughs> and sorry, if you're pushing beyond, say, 400, 500 days, is this... So the mean? minimum for us is 500 days, uh, mainly for calibration. Um, we're pushing beyond 900, 1,000 days. We, we can get Cobra 57 that way. That's what we did for 2012 CG and 11 FE. Um, in order to get iron 55, you have to go beyond 1,500 days, which is very hard to do even with the nearest supernova. It might be possible for 11 FE, uh, but that's six megaparsecs away. Everything else is farther away, so harder. And then finally, just briefly, we talk about the integrated light curve, but can you not get information from color as far as contaminating sources to further constrain your model? So as far as contamination goes, light echoes are the worst, and for that you do want color. So we didn't have color information for 12CG. Ben and Wolfgang did have it for 11 FE. Um, you want to be able to reconstruct a bolometric light curve. That might be harder than we initially thought at these late times, as we're not sure what fraction of the light uh, comes out in the infrared, and maybe even the mid-infrared. Um, so we'll, it's a it's a newish field, so we're still working that. And on this note, let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Or Graur. I'm a new NSF postdoctoral fellow here at the CFA. I'm also a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History. So if anyone's visiting New York and wants tickets, come talk to me. Um, I'm going to talk about something slightly different today. Um, I'll show you some results from a reanalysis we just concluded of the supernova sample from the Lick Observatory Supernova Search, or LOSS. Uh, this is work I've done at NYU together with Maria Mojes' group and with Isaac Shivers and Alex Filipenko over at UC Berkeley and Nathan Smith at the University of Arizona. Now, we've heard about Type 1A supernovae. These are supernovae that come from white dwarfs. I'll talk about a few more types, so just so we're on the same page. I will take a quick look at my phylogenetic supernova tree of death. Um, I'll be talking about type 2 supernovae, which are core collapse supernovae that have broad age alpha features in the spectra. I'll also discuss stripped envelope supernovae. These are also core collapse supernovae, but they either show very little or no hydrogen in the spectra. Those are the 2Bs and 1Bs, respectively 
all no hydrogen and no helium. Those are the one Cs. We say they're core collapse supernovae. We think their progenitor stars need to have their hydrogen and helium envelopes somehow stripped in order for us not to, th not to see this in the spectra. So we worked with the LOSS supernova sample. LOSS is an ongoing survey for supernovae conducted uh, by Alex Filipenko's group over at UC Berkeley with the robotic K telescope. Uh, in, tw in 2011, they released a series of very good, very important papers that discussed the more than 900 supernovae they discovered in their first decade of observations. Uh, we have now submitted a series of three new papers that go back and reanalyze this sample. These papers are on ASOPH. You can read them. You can send me comments. I'll be very happy. Uh, what we did, looking backwards, was two things. First of all, we looked at two of the loss samples. Loss itself discovered more than 900 supernovae. We looked at a rates sample, which has about 700 supernovae. For the host galaxies of these supernovae, we crossed them with SDSS spectroscopy so that we could get host galaxy information, um, stellar masses, star formation rates, metallicities, and so on. Then we re-derived the rates and, find, and looked at correlations between those rates and the galaxy properties. Now, finally, we made sure that all of this will be reproducible. So the old control times, the new information about the host galaxies, about the supernovae, everything has been made public through these new papers. So you can go into them and you can check that I didn't do anything stupid. We also looked at a second subsample of about 180 objects, which are volume limited, which means that according to loss, these, uh, this sample is complete for all core collapse supernovae out to 60 megaparsecs and type 1a supernovae out to 80 megaparsecs. Which means that you can take this sample and you can look at the fractions of the different supernova types within it and then you can talk about relative rates. Not absolute rates, meaning not rates per unit, how many per unit time per unit mass, but out of all core collapse supernovae what fraction are 1Bs or 1Cs or 1As? And so we de rederive those rates. We reclassify each and every supernova in this subsample using additional data, spectra, and light curves that were collected after the initial classifications and based on what we hope is a better understanding of supernova physics and classification. So here's what we found. Looking at the absolute rates from the 700 plus supernovae, we find a statistically significant deficiency of stripped envelope supernovae relative to type 2 supernovae in low mass galaxies. So you can see that if, if we look at the ratio between stripped envelope and type 2 supernovae, when you go from high mass galaxies down to low mass galaxies below 10 to the 10 solar masses, you see a sharp decline. This effect has been shown before by other authors, but those authors invariably used heterogeneous samples of supernovae that they collected from the literature, which means that those samples had unknown systematic biases when it comes to the classification of the supernovae by each survey and the detection efficiencies and so on. They also usually didn't look at the significance of the results. In this case, the loss supernova sample is homogeneous and very well understood. And we've conducted a series of statistical tests to figure out whether this is indeed significant. And it is at more than three sigma. Now, we'll go into the volume limited sample. One of the strange results from the 2011 papers was that when you looked at the fractions, You've, they found that type 1c supernovae were twice as common as 1b supernovae. This was very hard to understand from a theoretical point of view. Now, Isaac Shivers, 
who is just finishing his PhD at UC Berkeley and is applying for jobs. So, you know, look out for his name. And was an undergrad here, okay. Um, he's the one who reclassified all of the supernovae in this volume limited sample. And once you uh, correctly classify the stripped envelope supernovae, he finds that type 1c supernovae are actually half as common as 1b's, which is somewhat easier to understand. Now, when you look at this pie chart, this pie chart assumes that all galaxies are the same, which we know is wrong. We just saw that when you go to low mass galaxies, you expect to see a deficiency of stripped envelope supernovae. So if we divide the volume limited sample into two according to host galaxy mass, we find exactly this expectation. Type 1b and 1c supernovae are three times as common in high mass galaxies than in low mass ones. This is, again, statistically significant. The exploded slices are the ones where the effect is significant. Intriguingly, even though we still see this effect, we see no such effect for type 2b supernovae. Remember, 2b's are also stripped envelope supernovae. They're the ones that show a little bit of hydrogen um, after explosion, which then goes away. You might expect to see a similar effect. We do not. This is robust to the mass cut that we choose. Um, one uh, possible problem here is that we're still dealing with low number statistics, especially when we subdivide the sample. We also find that 87A-like supernovae are statistically significantly seen only in low mass galaxies. And we also see nine times more uh, supernova imposters in low mass galaxies. This has a huge caveat attached to it um, that these are not classified and uh, discussed as robustly as the actual supernova types. So take this with a grain of salt. For type 1a supernovae, we find that normal 1a's, the ones used for cosmology, are 30% more common in low mass galaxies. And this also is statistically significant. This means that when you, if you want to construct a homogeneous sample of type 1a's at different redshifts, you would be well served to target low mass galaxies. It's interesting to note that even though this is not quite significant, the missing fraction of normal 1a's in high mass galaxies is exactly made up by the subluminous 91 BG-like supernovae, which makes me wonder Again, whether 1BGs are actually a slightly different type of normal 1A, if they come from the same progenitor, but that progenitor has some tweak to one of its variables, whether it's metallicity or mass or something else, and that these are not a completely different channel of supernovae. So this is something I'm thinking of right now. So... <clears throat> With that, let me put up my summary slide. Um, I'll reiterate these three papers are up on AstroPH now. Um, all the data is public, so if you want to do supernova rates with loss or host galaxy property studies, you can go into these papers and extract all the data. Uh, I we also look at how our rates compare to those of other surveys. I didn't discuss this properly here. Um, I will point out that there is more science to do with loss. I'll also say that loss was problematic in that it was a targeted survey which looked at bright, massive galaxies. We had low mass galaxies in there, but they are not quite indicative of what you expect to see in the field. Other surveys like PTF and Assassin have 
better galaxy samples and they might have better supernova samples over time. PTF is doing a similar uh, analysis to this, um, and Assassin, I hope, will do so in the coming years. So I'm in Perkin 317. If you want to come and talk to me, you can also play with my model trains. Um, and with that, I'll take questions. So paper one uh, looks at correlations between the rates and stellar mass, star formation rates, and metallicities. And we find significant correlations um, for all of these, for all the supernova types. However, that's meaningless. <laughs> um, it's meaningless because of the known galaxy scaling relations, like you just mentioned, between mass and metallicity. So the moment your supernova rates are correlated with one galaxy property, they will be correlated with all the others. So we show correlations, but we cannot show causation. So whether it's some... Hmm? For that, you need theorists, yes. So you can take the rates, and you can uh, fit them with different models. I will caution not to fit the correlations themselves so much as um, more like these types of uh, uh, variables where you have a ratio between two things and you see some kind of behavior that's different from what you would naively expect. My question was less external than external, kind of theoretical nature. So given that you know the difference in velocity, like across this uh, difference in rate, is that really enough to explain the overall abundance of the one we see using the higher mass, higher metallicity galaxies? Uh, simply by saying that it's So we haven't done this kind of fitting yet. Um, it's something that I'm, I've discussed with Nathan, Nathan Smith to do in a follow-up paper. Um, Pat Kelly uh, did do s something like this in a 2012 paper with Bob Kirchner, um, where they had something like this plot, but not from rates, rather from supernova number ratios. And they did um, superimpose different models for binaries and uh, single stars. Off the top of my head, I don't remember which of those was uh, more consistent with the results. Um, I would note that Pat's measurements weren't significant, though. So okay. it's still hard. Uh, but this is definitely something to do. All right. Um, I'd like to tell you about something fairly different from large exploding things, uh, variable and polarized emission from a brown dwarf. So uh, why should you care? Well, if you think cosmology is the only interesting thing in the world, I don't think I can convince you of that. But uh, it turns out that brown dwarfs have very strong magnetic fields, kilogauss fields, um, which is not something that was expected. And uh, radio emission turns out to be the best way, or really the only effective way that we have 
to probe this emission. So um, in a very, very schematic uh, indication of this, we have a plot here where this is the Earth. So we've got mass versus sort of a magnetic field strength. This is Jupiter, and this is something like an active M dwarf. So Earth about a, kilo, Earth about a gas, Jupiter 10 gas, uh, active stars kilogas. So, um, you know, even I can draw a line through that. And then, um, you know, the brown dwarfs land here. So the same strength, although an order of magnitude lower mass. And, you know, this is not the most thrilling looking rendition, but I mean, if you look at the gap here, you know, that's an order of magnitude. Um, and if we're talking energetically, you know, you square that. And I think, you know, if you had asked theorists, say 15, 20 years ago, what sort of magnetic field would you expect from a brown dwarf? They probably would have said, yeah, 100 gas, I don't know. Um, and uh, we actually get something a lot bigger than that. So, uh, why do we care? Um, well, first of all, this means that these objects are operating some kind of dynamo that is efficiently generating strong magnetic fields. Uh, this is, you know, these things are fully convective. We believe that the sun's dynamo uh, has a lot to do with uh, the interface between its radiative core and its convective outer layers. So the fact that these things can generate organized, strong, persistent magnetic fields is uh, interesting from a theoretical standpoint. Uh, furthermore, things like low mass stars seem to have inflated radii relative to models. We believe that probably is also the case in true brown dwarfs. And so their fundamental parameters have, are changed by the magnetism. Um, and it turns out from uh, the observations we have of these objects and analogies with planets, uh, these magnetic fields lead to very complicated, interesting uh, near space environments. So this is kind of a schematic of Jupiter's magnetosphere. So the solar wind is impinging on this. And you get all sorts of current systems and neat plasma effects uh, that really drive, um, basically what you're doing is you're taking the rotational energy of the object and its magnetic field energy and reconnection of happens that turns that into various energetic you know, current systems and then energetic particles that then impinge on their layers of the atmosphere. So you get a whole complex environment that, you know, planetary scientists spend their lives studying this stuff. Um, and furthermore, it does seem that brown dwarfs uh, magnetically are like really big planets. And planetary magnetic fields, as uh, you've often heard, are expected to be very important for habitability. And also, then, by measuring the magnetic field, you might be able to learn something about the interior structure of these objects. Uh, so the radio mission that we use to probe this magnetism uh, is basically due to uh, two chief mechanisms. So there's a good old synchrotron emission magnetic fields, energetic electrons. And so here is this kind of a sample light curve of a relatively interesting source. So there's a lot going on here, but these are kind of 10 hour chunks of uh, radio emission going up and down, which we believe is due to rotation. Um, and so, you know, we have smooth spectrum, it's got a peak, it's relatively steady, although clearly we have little bumps and wiggles going on here. Moderate polarization is usually what we see. And uh, yeah, we got this rotational modulation. Uh, another effect that we see really uniquely in the lowest mass objects uh, is bursty maser emission due to this thing called the electron cyclotron maser. So this light curve uh, up here is uh, Stokes total intensity and you see these peaks. And then here is uh, Stokes V, so circular polarization. And the fact that these are almost equal magnitudes tells you this uh, emission is almost 100% circular polarized, which is, um, you know, things like these weird plasma effects, uh, the cyclotron maser, I mean, I think these are pretty much the only processes in the universe that give you strong, intense circular polarization like that. Uh, the emission occurs at the cyclotron frequency. So if you've got an object with a magnetic field with a strength that goes up to a certain maximum value, uh, you'll see radio emission up to the cyclotron frequency corresponding to that magnetic field strength, and then it'll just cut off sharply. So that's distinctive. Uh, clearly, it's quite bursty because it's beamed, and so you get kind of a pulsar lighthouse type effect. Uh, strongly polarized, and then, again, we see this periodicity, which, again, we believe to be anchored in the magnetic field. So, um, when we're talking about uh, the, coolest, uh, the coolest objects whose magnetism we can probe, uh, we're currently in the T-dwarf regime. There are four known T-dwarfs that have radio emission that lets us probe their magnetic fields. Uh, the most recent one is uh, this thing, it's uh, WISE 1122 plus 25. So it's discovered the Arecibo by uh, Matt Root and Alex Bullshin, who have been uh, doing this project for a long time, surveying a bunch of these things. And of course, Arecibo is very big, has a lot of sensitivity. Um, it's very hard to see what's going on here, but it's actually not super relevant anyway. So if you just look at the bottom here, these are light curves where you see these radio bursts over spans of about hundreds of seconds um, over one epoch, and they detected this across five epochs. 
And uh, not shown here, the emission is highly polarized, looks very much like uh, this Bursky radio emission. Now what's interesting about this particular object is uh, Root and Mulchin suggested that this thing rotates incredibly fast. Uh, so they claimed a rotation period of around 17 minutes. Uh, you know, for something of, we don't know its mass, because it's a brown dwarf, but something, you know, Jupiter size, you know, Jupiter's 10 hours, so this is much, much faster. And of course, if you get to this number, you want to say, okay, is this physically possible? It's interesting, though, but for brown dwarfs, uh, the, you know, the breakup period, if we, put, if we phrase it that way, depends on the mean density, but because brown dwarfs contract as they age, we don't know what that is. If we had age constraints, maybe we'd know. Um, but we can't actually say how oblate this thing is or whether it is totally impossible for it to be rotating at this rate. Um, but we can say, if you believe this number, then it's about a giga year old. Uh, so this plot is showing the five bursts that they phase up um, as a function of phase. Uh, the key thing to point out here is, uh, look at these dates. So we've got 2013 May, late 2013 December, going into 2014. So they're claiming a 17-minute period, a 17 minute period uh, spanning like several hundred days worth of rotations with five data points. Uh, so Alex is a pulsar astronomer. He's used to things that are extremely good clocks, finds planets that way. Um, but this, this is a very uh, bold claim. Uh, so we followed it up. Uh, so me, Ito, uh, John Gizis at University of Delaware uh, got some observations using both the VLA and Gemini. Uh, so this is the Gemini light curve about a couple hours on source, and uh, essentially it seems to be steady at the end, end here. This is the air mass it's starting to set, so uh, we don't believe those points necessarily. So it's not much to say about the Gemini emission. Um, the radio emission that we uh, got, first I want to talk about what the data looked like. Uh, so we ended up with about two and a half hours on the target. So with the VLA, we're observing in uh, what we call C-band, so a very broad bandwidth of four to eight gigahertz. Uh, with lots of channels for the analysis, we just divided it into two halves, low and high, you know, average of five, average of seven. Uh, we have five second time resolution in the raw data. And then we do get polarization, um, but in this particular observation, we didn't calibrate the instrumental parameters. So you can do some basic polarimetric analysis, um, but not the really fancy stuff. And uh, the VLA's receivers are these circularly polarized kinds where we, they're innately sensitive to right helical and left helical emission. So we detected it, it's a point source. Uh, these are the light curves. So um, what is very interesting is this top panel is the right circular emission. This middle panel is the left circular emission. This bottom panel is kind of the polarization fraction where this is plus 100%, which is fully right polarized, and this is minus 100%. So I've averaged over the frequencies here. There's some interesting stuff there, but just for clarity. Uh, so what we see is, uh, so if we look at the right circular, we've got Low area, kind of double peaky thing, another low area rising again. The left is a little bit harder to see, but there are, so if you look right here and right here, those are statistically, if you average over those chunks of time, those are well above zero. Um, if you average over, say, here, um, it's maybe a little bit above zero, but if you think, if you give in typical VLA leakage from right into left is about 5%, um, you know, this could well be completely zero. And so that's manifested in this plot of the circular polarization versus time, where right around here, there's basically no right and all left. Around here, it's basically all right. And basically, it goes back again. So we're interested in this question of its rotation rate. So if you do a uh, analysis of periodicity, uh, the results are pretty much what you expect from that light curve. Um, so this big wavy curve is the Gemini. So this is a, a PDM phase dispersion minimization analysis. So it's basically a periodogram where low values correspond to periodic looking signals at candidate periods. Um, so the Gemini has basically no significant structure. Uh, so this is the period claimed by Root and Wolchin, uh, as you would guess from looking at these light curves. Uh, we don't see anything indicating that periodicity. Um, you know, if you could imagine different things where if just there was a certain thing that Oh, man. Um, OK, so uh, there are two peaks that you see. This one corresponds to phasing up these three things. This one corresponds to phasing up this tr sort of the pretty much twice the period phasing up that trough and these peaks. Uh, the data certainly don't support it. But given that we know that brown dwarfs often are rotating 
at hour-long periods with periodically varying emission. Um, I think this I think this longer period of around 160 minutes is right. I wouldn't bet like a lot of money on it, but I'd bet like a medium amount of money on it. Um, what sort of odds? Even odds. I'd bet a small amount of money on generous odds. Um, so I think schematically, the way to think about this is like this, where we've got uh, you know the, the right emission turning on, the left emission turning on, and uh, these peaks. Those are kind of a thing that you get from the cone beaming of the cyclotron maser. So we can understand that in a very simple dipole model. So just focus here. Say we have a brown dwarf. This is its equator. Uh, this is a prime meridian. Say this cap, this magnetic cap, uh, just emits pure right circularized emission. This emits pure left circular emission. So if you're looking at it right now, this will dominate. So it'll be mostly right circular polarized. So if we... Uh, start spinning, um, say we get around here. So this is uh, the solid line is the total intensity and uh, normalized to one. And this dotted line is the fractional polarization. So here, the cap is, uh, you know, it's mostly left circular polarized, but it's not as strong as in the other direction because the object is t slightly tilted towards us. So uh, you can see that. So say we uh, say we tilt the pole. So now, uh, so this is the latitude of center, which is basically 90 minus the inclination. So if we look at something from the above here, the total intensity stays about constant, and the fractional polarization stays about like that. So let's say there's something that's slightly tilted towards us, and then let's uh, offset the magnetic pole from uh, the uh, rotational axis. So we've got a p point of peak intensity right around now when we're seeing the entire right cap, and then 180 degrees later, uh, because it's tilted towards us, you don't see as much, so the intensity is much lower, and the circular polarization kind of flip-flops back and forth, which is, in my approximation, the phenomenology that we're observing. Obviously, we need more data, and hopefully the VLA TAC will give it to us. Thank you. Uh, they're almost all isolated. There are definitely ones that are binaries. Usually they're very low mass. So nothing, nothing that's like a close binary with a main sequence star or anything. Um, there are several ones which are known to be, say, you know, binaries where the total mass is still just a few tenths of a solar mass. Um, some of them are visual binaries where we really don't think that interaction should play a big role. Um, some, of them, some of them we don't know that. period of the object in question. So, you know, for the sun, there's a three-week rotational period and it has these 11-year cycles. Is there anything like that that could potentially explain the phenomenology that you're seeing here? Um, I mean, that is certainly a possibility. Uh, people have, so uh, naively, you'd think with these fully convective objects that you know, there's such symmetry, you know, it's just, it's, the, it's you know, it's rotate, rotating, and that's about it. It's hard to see how you'd have something flip-flopping like the solar cycle. Um, but people have argued that that, that might be happening, and uh, I'm a part of an ongoing monitoring campaign to, to look at radio emission over long times to see that. In terms of, I don't know if you're asking about comparing the proposed 17-minute number versus, but I mean, you know, it's quite possible that there will be, that the true period is these longer than what we observe, obviously. Um, you know, we just... But there's there is a very reason, it's very reasonable to have a prior of periodicity on time scales of a few hours. Okay, last comment is uh, today we had the papers only from the CFA and it didn't feel like it. It just shows how diverse uh, is the range of scientists here. We can hear about many different topics and still feel as if people come from outside. <laughs> so thank you all for coming.